Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to our second Focus Cities webinar of the year. My name is Garrett Fortein with UC Berkeley SafeTrack and I'm your host today. For those not familiar, SafeTrack stands for Safe Transportation Research and Education Center. We are a University of California Berkeley Research Center affiliated with the Institute of Transportation Studies and the School of Public Health. Our mission is to reduce transportation related injuries and fatalities through research, education, outreach, and community service. SafeTrack conducts research, provides technical assistance and workshops to communities across California, educates, educates the transportation safety professionals of tomorrow, and coordinates major transportation safety programs for the state of California. We are partners with California Walks for our Focus Cities efforts. California Walks is the statewide voice for pedestrian safety and healthy, walkable communities for people of all ages and abilities. They provide technical assistance to communities to create more walkable communities, and they also work at the state level to advance opportunities for active transportation. We'd also like to acknowledge the support of the California Office of Traffic Safety, who provided a grant through the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration for this program. We appreciate the dedicated support of community pedestrian and bicycle safety. Before we dive in, a couple of housekeeping reminders. Please be sure to mute your audio. We will be recording both the webinar audio and chat features, and we will make that recording available afterwards. If you do not want to be recorded, please refrain from talking or using the chat feature. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please type them in the chat box on your screen, and we will answer as many as you can at the end of the presentation. We encourage you to ask questions and make use of this feature. Okay, and with all that, I'm excited to introduce our panelists. Uh, so first we have Dorian Romero. Dorian Romero is a native of North Orange County. Having grown up skateboarding and traveling on foot and using public transit, her lived experience has allowed her to understand the nuances of Orange County's mobility challenges. At heart, she is an educator, always working to create programs that are inclusive of populations often left out of broader conversations. She's also an artist, regularly collaborating with local organizations in bringing art practices to communities, such as her volunteer efforts with Makara Lending Library and Chicas Raqueras in Southeast Los Angeles. She is an advocate for immigrants, LGBTQI plus communities and youth. Her passion for skateboarding has led her to co-creating an LGBTQI plus skateboard meetup group in Orange County. With us, we also have Christopher Fortin. Christopher Fortin is a multi-county journalist and active transportation advocate who has been working in urban planning and transportation for the past 10 years. He has worked on the outside as a reporter trying to hold decision makers to account and highlighting work by some of the best people trying to bring justice to communities and the built environment. He's also worked on the inside with groups like People for Mobility Justice as an education and outreach specialist, and more recently with Santa Ana Active Streets as its project director. He currently leads fundraising and development of SAS activities, community advocacy strategies, and management of long-term strategy development. He has assisted in developing outreach strategies and carrying out activities for Santa Ana's Central Santa Ana Complete Streets Plan, Citywide Active Transportation Plan, and education and encouragement activities through the city's bicycle and pedestrian safety program. All right, and now I'll hand it over to SAS. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Garrett. Uh, appreciate that introduction. Um, so my name is Christopher Fordin. Um, I'm with SAS, project director, um, and uh, joined today with my colleague, Dorian. Um, and we're going to be talking today about something probably a lot of folks on this call are very aware of, kind of uh, how you keep kept a basically functioning during the COVID pandemic, um, you know, uh, especially with our work being really important. But this is basically the story of what we learned and what, you know, lessons we kind of took um, during this period. And these are our beautiful faces. Um, uh, and uh, yeah. Um, actually, yeah, sorry. Uh, one thing about uh, this, so, so uh, SAS is actually made up of two staff people, um, myself and, uh, and Dorian. Um, we also are made up of a leadership committee, which kind of constitutes like our board of directors, which supports us in our activities. 
um, and also our programs committee, which we'll be talking about a little bit later. And that's actually our body of residents and volunteers and community members. Um, SAS is a community-based coalition um, with a mission of cultivating diverse community participation and creating a safe and accessible environment for active transportation in Santana. Formed in 2013, our vision is to empower residents to become engaged participants in active transportation in Santana by hosting community events, partnering with local organizations, and working directly with city, county, and regional officials. And to give a little context of the community in Santana, um, Santana has a population of just under 330,000, and it's one of the 14 highest population cities in the state. It's more than 76% Latinx, a large portion of this population are monolingual Spanish speakers, and half the population don't have access to a personal vehicle. It's regularly in the top five in highest collision rate involving a pedestrian cyclist in the state and at times in the nation. But as you kind of see in the photo, um, this was taken during an open street event. Um, cyclists and pedestrian culture is really present and it's, all, it's been present. The missing link for many years though had been um, um, safe infrastructure and education. And now Dorian's gonna go over the pillars of our organization. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to be covering three pillars that shape our organization. The first one is our education one. Um, so we educate the Santa Ana community on the active transportation policy process and how to be safe users. Here in this photo, you can see examples of our helmet fitting demo up on the left, our BC Basics classes, our wrench and ride program, which is a fix your own bicycle program, and our safety workshops. Another pillar is our advocacy. We advocate the, for equitable and progressive policy and infrastructure change. In the past, we have been involved in street design planning. For example, the downtown Santa Ana and central Santa Ana complete streets plan and the active transportation plan. Other city and regional advocacy has included being involved in the Santa Ana general plan process and advocating with our transportation agency, the Orange County Transportation Authority. My personal favorite is our Activate pillar. We activate our streets and public spaces through fun bike rides like our Sassy Thursdays, walking tours and traffic safety fairs. Seen above, we have our Lonely Hearts ride. We'll highlight this later in the presentation. We also have our Lucis Vivas event and our Walk of Lights which enhances the importance of pedestrian and cyclist visibility. We consider this a fun first step of community engagement that is considered a low level of commitment. Thank you, Doran, for that. And so we knew that we wanted to continue to do in-person events as in, you know, starting to kind of start talk about um, like how we adapted to COVID. Um, we, we knew we wanted to do in-person events, um, but we want to do them while maintaining the safety of all people, um, whether folks participating, staff, volunteers, um, and again, the general public. And while our staff and board of directors have been essential uh, in navigating this period, we really couldn't done have done this pivot without our programs committee. And so this committee is actually made up of residents and community members wanting to help out with our activities. Um, this group became even more essential during the pandemic because they've offered ideas on what kind of events to host, but also how we should be safe. We would meet every couple of weeks and we even branched out into an activate subcommittee which one of our members is here, gonna give a shout out to Irene, um, which supported our activities uh, we we're doing to activate community, um, like our bike rides and our bike light helmet distribution events. And so we knew we wanted to 
do, like I said, do these in-person events. Um, but we need to start kind of creating a checklist of uh, what could actually be, um, you know, what was the kind of materials that were necessary or just a checklist, a, a, almost like a COVID checklist um, to make sure if we're going to go out into the community, we have these things in place. So one of the resources we were able to, you know, everybody I think needed at that time was face masks. So we ended up really um, reaching out to partners, uh, one of them being the Bicycle Tree, which has been a longtime partner of ours, which is a bicycle cooperative in the city of Santa Ana. And they honestly service the rest of the county. And they're the only bike cooperative in the, in the region. And so we... Um, since we had that partnership with them, they actually donated some masks early on. So that helped, but we also reached out to mutual aid networks like the anti suing squad. And, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the name right now we also, uh, got, um, reached out to mutual aid network that did 3d printing for face shields. And so those resources honestly came in really handy in making sure that we we're able to get all those materials, both for our volunteers, but also offer them to the general public as well, too, in case they didn't have a mask, we were able to give them one um, on hand. Um, you know, other checklist stuff that, you know, most folks I imagine are familiar with at this point, um, you know, sanitizer, gloves, a thermometer, um, and then making sure if we're doing any in-person events that we have a form of RSVP online, but really offering stuff like text, um, instant, uh, Instagram, um, opening our, our private message channel, and then also offering, as you've probably seen in most restaurants, QR codes, options to get the URL, um, whether it was printed or included in a flyer, um, making sure we offered uh, that QR code, but all these other kind of avenues to actually get to that RSVP page. Thank you, Chris. Um, now we're gonna get into some of the important programs we did throughout the past year. Um, so Luces Vivas is one of our most popular events and it's part of our Activate Pillar within our coalition. This event has direct impact within the community because we immerse ourselves amongst these commuters who are traveling from place to place on foot, public transportation, bicycle, scooter, wheelchair, skateboard, etc. So this checklist was really essential for this in-person event. And so Luces Vivas is our bike light and helmet distribution program. We use the transportation injury mapping system or TIMS to find intersections in the city with high collision rates for pedestrians and cyclists. We set up three sections in on these intersections, which include tote bags with safety materials inside, reflective vests when available, and a helmet fitting demo and distribution. So we tend up to set up on the grassy areas of these intersections. The materials inside the tote bags include coloring books for kids that talk about helmet and bike safety, SAS info flyers, COVID information from Latino Health Access, pocket-sized rules of the road, reflective spoke cards and wristbands, as well as small silicone bike lights. Normally, before we set up, we communicate with the local businesses and homeowners nearby to inform them of what we are doing for the duration of the event and why we're at that specific location. Oftentimes, the employees come out to our event and gather the free materials as well. Um, this past year, something new we added was this cone system. Um, on the top right, you see the cones to ensure that the residents maintain the six feet distance to be um, to follow the COVID guidelines. And here's a very cute picture on the left. We have some El Pollo Loco employees coming out to our Luces Vivas. This was in April on Harbor and First here in Santana. On the right, you see a picture of some mechanics who saw our event from across the street. We were at Madison Park and they came on over. This was in July. And so our volunteers are amazing. They really help us out during this event. Um, they help hold signs and at the intersections to tell drivers to slow down and be aware of pedestrians. 
They also help direct anyone who's passing by to come on over to the event. Um, currently, our budget with the Office of Traffic Safety allows us to purchase bike lights, helmets, reflective wristbands, and air pumps. But here in this picture, for that cycle, we were able to budget for some reflective vests because we heard many of the residents come and ask if we had any. Um, we do hope to budget for them in the future because they're very popular. And we didn't want to put our volunteers or our staff at risk, so we accounted for a different system, uh, wearing masks, wearing the clear visors, um, using the latex gloves, and also we went old school and fitted helmets using, using the measuring tape and string. And so once the participants receive the helmet, there's a, a safety, a helmet safety demo with poster boards. Another component of our Luces Vivas is that we try to partner with other groups in the community before every event. Since we were getting out into the community at places that were not often frequented, we wanted to make sure that we were also connecting residents to things that affected their lives or might have value for them to be a part of. Shown here, you see us partnered with a local nonprofit called Orange County Environmental Justice. We were collecting surveys for the city of Santa Ana's planning for its environmental justice element. This was a meaningful way to connect residents to city planning efforts they may, they may not have known about, but that affect their lives directly. Aside from that, this event is also important because although helmets and bike lights won't stop a speeding or fast moving car, we know our community appreciates these kinds of investments especially because many tell us they can't afford the supplies we provide. This summer, we partnered with one of our founding coalition partners, Latina Health Access, who has been doing COVID testing and vaccine efforts in hard to reach communities. We reach parts of the city not usually frequented and in areas that are often seen as pass through we get about 100 to 150 people passing by our event that is an hour and a half to two hours. It is crucial to include such a resource as LHA's COVID info during these events. We'll continue to partner with them for the rest of our Lucis Vivas events. Um, and thank you for this section. Now we'll move on to our next featured event. And next is our Sassy Thursdays, but I wanted to also give a shout out to one other group we've been actually working with. It's called um, Tenants United Santana. And so since we're constantly working with partners, they're also working on uh, getting housing rights information out to residents as well. So we've been able to use our Los Vivas events to also have them to come out and actually share these kind of housing rights resources, eviction, eviction resources as well. So as you kind of see, you know, we use this opportunity to talk about a lot of different issues outside of even just general traffic safety. So our next event is Sassy Thursdays. Um, it's our weekly series of bike rides and uh, or walks. Um, this summer, we've already hosted two out of a total planned four rides with funding from the Southern California Association of Governments or SCAG. In this funding, we are only doing bike rides though. Um, what you see in the slide is an image of our summer solstice ride hosted in June, which was not a part of our Sassy Thursday series, but shows how we already started thinking how to do these events with COVID in mind. And as you can see, there's a bunch of people with masks that's not there by accident. So ideas for these rides really, again, come from residents, and we always try to work with local artists as well. Um, Using art gives a sense of pride and uniqueness that folks can connect with since they also understand the community they are a part of. And we're always pushing to get them paid. Um, but because of COVID, we started to planning around making it COVID safe. So during the pandemic, we've hosted these events in two formats. Uh, the first one has been in person. Not much has changed pre-pandemic and during. Um, the rides are usually no more than five miles, and we always have a short route for children to also join. 
We also offer a limited number of bikes to borrow. But what changed was we asked everyone to wear a mask, high, highly encouraging people to RSVP and go through our COVID, COVID checklist of offering a mask, sanitizer. Um, we've at times offered food, but it had to be you know prepackaged. So stuff like, honestly, banh mi sandwiches have worked well for us. So always thinking how we can limit that kind of contact with folks. The other type of ride we created was a virtual ride. Um, I think I've seen a lot of these kind of virtual rides popping up um, and we did one as well. Um, you know, we did, and we did this honestly in response to the spike in COVID cases around January and February. We knew people were exhausted from social distancing but they really wanted some sort of connection with others. So we started talking to our Activate Steering Committee about it. We were actually considering first a in-person ride, um, but the uh, committee members expressed that they had concerns about doing an in-person ride. So we started brainstorming um, what a virtual version would look like. Since the ride was also during the Valentine Day season and we wanted to do a Valentine's Day ride, uh, they came up with the name to kind of signify that we've really been separate from our loved one, loved ones, making you know us a little lonely. So this ride really was for those lonely hearts who still wanted to make a connection. We created two other flyers to show also how to participate. Folks had to register to get a, a swag or like a kind of gift bag, which included a voucher for a free, free paleta helmets and bike lights. Uh, so the voucher is actually the paleta, not the helmets. We would actually give helmets and bike lights. Um, the, we, we would have folks scan for uh, the route uh, uh, and it was presented uh, as a scavenger hunt to learn about local Santa Ana history. And then we finally created a Spotify mix for any folks who wanted to go on the ride. So if anybody has any interest, if you want to take a pause and get out your cell phones, you can scan those QR codes, they still work. So if you wanted to listen to the music or check out the route, you're more than welcome to. And so if you did scan the route, um, you would see this. Um, we use the easy travel app to record and type information about each stopping point that included the history uh, on murals and historic buildings. Um, and and then we uh, had other kind of components that we'll go over a little bit, but I'm actually going to give a little tour of the software. So this is not what it looks like on your phone, but um, this is uh, but this is the general framework. Um, we created the app in English and in Spanish, so you can actually toggle in between. There would be an audio summary. Um, and then each stop would have its own written text so if you wanted to read it, you can read it, or if you wanted to listen to, listen to it, you could also, let me see if I can actually turn on the audio, share sound. Let's see, this one. Here we are at the Santa Ana Public Library. The statue in front of the library facing Civic Center Drive is of Alex O'Day, a Palestinian American civil rights activist who served as the West Coast Regional Director for the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee. On October 11th, 19... So there, so we had a um, story for each of them. And like I said, we had them both in English or in Spanish. So when people were using, if they, you were using the app, they can actually get pinged like, hey, they're in the general vicinity of where the space is. Um, also, you can look at it just on your regular a web browser on your phone as well. And again, uh, the Spanish. Mural, Visions of Santa Ana. Visiones de Santa Ana de Emigdio Vázquez, ubicado en el Angels Park. De la aplicación My Barrio Murals de la Universidad de Chapman, acerca del artista según el museo. So as you can see, I'm pretty happy with that app. It was, it was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun to create. And so um, the issue though was, okay, now we got this app how do we actually get the word out on it for people to use? And this is where we did something a little different and didn't just stay online and do the, the put out the word online. We actually got out, uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, we actually got out into, in, into the, into the, onto the streets 
and um, and actually show people how to use this uh, how to use this app. Give me one second. Sorry, got a little turn around. So the picture on the left, you know, we actually uh, shows actually us um, showing folks how to use the QR code um, to scan the route, um, scan the Spotify playlists. Um, on the right, we actually ended up doing also helmet fitting demos as well too. So we provided those materials. We showed people how to actually use the the application and the route and even gave them the voucher at that point for the free paleta. So this is also an opportunity for us to kind of still have that in-person connection, um, still be socially distant and masked up and safe, but you know, being able to kind of give that extra step in in educating on that 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 challenge might, that might be with understanding this new technology. And so 16 out of 27 registered participants came to pick up their tote bag on Friday. Uh, 31 out of 50 registered folks came to pick up on Saturday with eight newly registered participants signing up the day of the event. Um, we, so we had a total of 85 participants register for the event and a total of 55 participants actually participate in the event. And to be honest, this has actually been sometimes better than even our in-person bike rides. Um, we asked participants to tag uh, Lonely Hearts Ride, uh, the hashtag Lonely Hearts Ride, or tag the SAS account. And they would actually send us these images um, that we would then put them in a raffle. And so we got a lot of these similar images of just folks out, out in the community checking out all these different sites. So it was really, really fun. Can I interrupt, Chris? Yeah, go ahead. Um, if anybody needs interpretation, please put it in the chat. Um, si alguien necesita interpretación, por favor, póngalo en el chat. Okay. Um, so moving on to the next activity, our safety workshops. And so, um, you know, I, I always get really high on that uh, those the sassy Thursday rides and what we we're able to do there, but you know, kind of shifting over to something that I think a lot of folks are familiar with, kind of online presentations. And so, um, you know, we did the same uh, for a lot of our workshops, shifting to virtual meetings. Um, and so, our safety workshops are presentations that teach the basic principles of active transportation and transit systems, including demystifying the rules of the road for when driving, biking, skateboarding, or on foot. Um, topics have included talking about active transportation safety and strategies for making an area safer and accessible. And, and so on the right, uh, if, as you're looking at the slides, um, uh, is, the, is a workshop called Why Our Santa Ana Streets Are the Way They Are. And the focus was to teach the basics of active transportation through the lens of the city's history. Their history of making roads unsafe and its recent history of improving the infrastructure for bicyclists and pedestrians. On the left, Moveta Santana uh, was our workshop where we summarized the past six to seven years of active transportation planning from plans such as the Active Transportation Plan, Central Santa Ana Complete Streets Plan, Downtown Santa Ana Complete Streets Plan, and the Safe Process School Plan. So traditionally, again, all our safety workshops were um, either a presentation or a panel for the first half and an interactive activity for the second half. The why Santa Ana streets are the way they are activity is usually done in person to allow folks a hands-on opportunity to build their ideal street to walk or bike. Um, this photo is actually, these photos were actually taken during an event pre-COVID. So we couldn't do this activity, but we, wanted to try to do something that was either similar or maintain the essence of it, even if through Zoom. So we created, so we created this. Um, we asked people, uh, so we actually kept a presentation component, but the second portion um, kept an interactive component. So we asked people to grab a piece of paper, pen, and if possible, any physical items in their direct vicinity. It could be toys, mints, pens, hair curlers, and then we asked participants to imagine their ideal street. We asked two questions. What would make you walk, roll, um, bike, or skate in Santana? And what would your street or a street you travel on make you walk, roll on it? The only rule, everyone had to draw, uh, build, or both. 
And so we did this for 10 minutes and then everyone could text, email, or DM us on our Instagram, the image. Um, we then uploaded the image into our Google Drive folder and then presented them on the spot. And what you see in the slide is what folks made. On the right, someone drew Bristol, which, uh, Bristol Street, which is today is three travel lanes both ways and lined with palm trees. And the image I see is someone on a skateboard, I think on the sidewalk with ample tree space, probably would have good shading. On the left, we see something like a multi-use path. There are a couple more images. Um, these are a couple more images. Um, the one on the left shows a need for wide sidewalks, food vendors, and park space, but also there's less car space and more people space. The image on the right shows Bristol again, and it's reimagined with a bus only lane, protected bike lane with car on the outside and open space uh, complete with community garden. So a few things we learned from these events are that residents live, work, and play in this community and are the experts in what needs to be changed, adjusted, and removed. So they really guide the direction of our activities. Um, we have each other's support and are in solidarity with each other's efforts. This is what makes us stronger. So reaching out to these mutual aid networks um, has been very useful for us. Our community-based coalition is about connecting and networking with those in our community. So reaching out for help and to help is a way to build these connections. Um, collaborating means everyone has ideas to offer. Uh, learn and engage with one another to keep the core of our work alive and moving forward. Um, and then the last point here is Although this past year was difficult for all of us because of COVID, we felt these programs had to continue in our community because Santa Ana is often one of the top five in highest collision rates in the state and sometimes the nation. Residents in this community find these educational and safety materials crucial to their daily lives. And so thank you everybody for sticking around and listening to our webinar. Here is our contact information. All right, thank you so much, Chris and Dorian. So we're gonna take some time now for questions. I invite those who have a question to type it in the chat box. Um, and I think we have a, a cozy enough group of folks here that I think folks could unmute themselves and ask a question. Um, if you desired to, obviously, no pressure. Um, and I have some things that I am really interested in and we'll start out sort of asking about. Um, then first off is sort of the Lonely Hearts ride, which um, the more I learn about it, like the more curious and interested I become. Um, and so I've got a number of questions I sort of want to sort of delve into and sort of learn a little more about, about it and about sort of the, um, like the process of creating it. And so first off, I wanted to ask about sort of the, the Izzy travel app I see is, is what it was created in, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. Is it like free for anyone to build their own tour? Like, it, does it have a tool to help you put the content together? Yeah, it's a, from my understanding, it's a free app. Um, I know there's like, I think there's ad components to it. So I think that's probably how it's free. Um, but, um, but for the most part, it is a free app. Um, the interface on the back, it's, um, it's, it's a, there's a lot, there's a lot of tutorials that help, I would say helps, um, uh, to kind of navigate the, the back end of it. Um, a lot of it is just, you know, if you're able to put, a, a summary on a word document, gather a couple photos, that's pretty much the basis of actually starting it out. Um, there are a couple other components of like, um, um, uh, like actually creating the route creating the sites. Um, the neat thing about the app though, um, that is once you create what they call it tourist attraction, once you create that site, you can actually use those sites as different, on different 
um, like let's say tours or different routes that you want. So once it's already uploaded, you can just continue to use the same ones if it's actually something you want to use in the future. So I would say there, there, there are a few um, tutorials that help, um, but, and, and honestly, those things were really helpful in actually making those puttings together. Cool, all right, thanks. And then, um, so the content, right? So you, and I know you mentioned some of this already, like the route, the uh, sort of the locations. So you had the, um, did you have it, the photos and the sort of the narratives already together or did you have to put those together and then get everything recorded? Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, Darren, feel free to uh, step in as well. I know you, you're a part of, uh, we're, we both kind of helped out with this process, but I, I think it was, it was a lot of work from honestly volunteers. Um, I think one of the one of the reasons why we also tried to do like an art and mural component is because we had a historian, uh, Manny Escamilla, um, who uh, is a born and raised historian in Santana. And um, he really helped to draft a lot of the history. Um, you know, we also, uh, I think myself and Doran actually also pulled from different kind of research. We kind of found photos where we could. Um, so it was really a team effort in putting the content together. Um, but really, I think knowing that we had that really rich resource of a historian to help us out is why we also felt comfortable to put the ride together in that way. Um, but then we also partnered with an inter interpreter that interpreted all the content because, you know, we're still pretty busy and we don't have that much time to do interpretation. So the interpreter actually interpreted it. And it just so happened that she's also a local of the city. She loves our work. And so she ended up actually recording it um, for free on for, uh, for us. We're really surprised by that. But, you know, that and so that's the thing I think, you know, is as much as and that's why we try to also work with local residents because they're also much more tied uh, to it. So sometimes we'll get that kind of generosity here and there. So I, I would say it was, it was very much a team effort, but it was a lot of work, it was no joke about it. Thank you. I love it, I love it, honestly. It's such a great example. I mean, you're, what you've shown us today is so many examples of this, but such a good example of like working with, we say working with the community, but it is working with the community, right? Working with experts and, you know, a historian, an interpreter, people who are, are professionals and um, like linking up with their expertise. So, and like giving, you know, amplifying them. So everyone sort of doing the thing they're good at, good at and putting it all together. I will say one thing about the app. It's not difficult to use. Even I was able to use it. I'm not very tech savvy, but the only hard thing is making time to put everything into the app and recording it. And also because it was bilingual, that took more time. So don't fear, the app is easy. It's just, if you have the time, you know, that, that was the only hard part. Yeah, I hear it, I hear it. So thank you. Okay, well that, that definitely puts some more light on that for me. Um, in terms of thinking about, you know, how, how we can potentially use this in our own, you know, work such as, you know, uh, you know, traffic safety or the pedestrian bike safety workshops that we do, things like that. And so also thinking about sort of ways to sort of learn about, I, I guess we we call it a hybrid, right? That's what we've been calling it is um, activities that aren't solely in person or solely virtual, right? They sort of like cross between the two. And I think that that's another thing that I'm you know, trying to figure out and I've seen a lot of examples of what you've talked about today is um, like different ways of making hybrid events work. And so I wanted to ask, what are some of the like things you've learned or things you've discovered or obstacles that you've encountered with this sort of hybrid you know, not fully online, not fully in person um, kind of events. I think everybody is interested in the content um, in some way or another, it relates to their personal lives. Um, but when you have online events, you will attract different people, different audiences, 
Um, so you have to make it attractive. You have to make it worthwhile for people. So um, it's very different online than in person. In person, you see, you connect differently. Um, I don't know where I was going with that, but you definitely have to promote it in a way that is attractive to people online. Um, but when we do like our Lucis Vivas events that are in person, there's, there's conversation and there's a different way to connect. So both are important and um, both have a whole different vibe. And I think in terms of doing a hybrid model, um, I, I think it kind of goes to the principal nature of, of um, that it's, it's, I think a lot of folks were very concerned initially of even going out into like the public realm. Um, you know, I think, you know, we, we went back and forth about it all the time too. You know, we did see early on folks at um, food distribution events, we saw folks, you know, you know, even just grocery workers, you know, so, you know, if our work was very much in that public realm already, it's like, we should be out in that public realm, like people still need these safety materials, but also still, we still needed to be having conversation with people. And we just had the benefit of being able to do it in the public realm. And so I feel like when we're, you know, developing that hybrid model, it's just that we knew we wanted to make sure that we weren't diluting, honestly, our communication with people that it was very intentional. Um, you know, I think virtual, um, this, this virtual kind of realm we've been working in, it's obviously very fatiguing. Um, it has been it developed a lot of really strong relationships and communication and stories, like even with our safety workshop, where we're able to just do this very interactive kind of activity. Um, but making sure it's, I think, I think it really starts with that principle is like, you know, not saying that like this activity suffices for our checklist. No, we want to make sure that it actually is very, there's a very intentional, uh, purpose to it. And actually we're there are all the folks that are participating are actually getting something really, um, good, something they're learning something or they're getting some, a lot of value out of it. So I think just it goes to that principle of like we knew we wanted to make sure that it, uh, that that was a a part of the intention of us going out and talking to people and developing this hybrid model is that we didn't want to dilute the experience as much as possible. Um, and then you know I think the safety stuff is was always going to be something that was going to be there that was always going to be a challenge. Um, so I think just constantly balancing those two. Um, uh, as you know, we kind of progressed into the pandemic. All right, thank you both. Yeah, so I wanted to to sort of take that that question about or that you know knowledge about you know, communication, keeping those lines of communication open, um, you know, making sure to continue you know communicating with the community, and I wanted to try to uh, ask about that in the online setting uh, because I know, for example, right? So this webinar, we had registration on Zoom, right? And so we sent emails, you know, we did outreach, you know, um, but it's you know, the registrations on Zoom. And I think um, in your presentation, you talk about like doing registration and outreach and having multiple platforms, because I think as what we all know, like different, different folks, different communities use different platforms. And so I wanted to ask about your experiences, you know, using different, you know, different social media platforms. Um, what are some of the things that have worked? What are some things that you've learned in terms of that, you know, multiple platforms for online content? Different platforms definitely have their own style. Um, so we, we use Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, we update our website and what helps when people register is that we have their contact information 
and we input their info on a newsletter newsletter um, and that also sends out updates on what we have been doing and what future events we'll be doing um, so by having those people register not everybody likes to register in advance but at least that connects keeps us connected to them for inviting to future things um, something we did we tried to do was um, you know call folks um, check in on them we had a survey where we wanted people to give us direct feedback on an event they participated in or um, just give us suggestions on how their experience was. And I think when we, we do that, we keep people coming back because we're connecting with them in a different level, not just a, hey, you came to our event and that's it. Um, so I think that does attract people to come back, especially for our bi-monthly programs meetings. That's how we maintain a, it's a tiny group of people who do come, but I think by, by doing that, it does um, connect people more. Um, I think in another, another lesson, um, is is a uh, it's uh, i guess one one component being that like you know i think there's uh in turn kind of creating your agenda for like let's say a bunch of zoom meetings um you know it, it, whether you're using zoom or google meets or any other kind of list of products microsoft teams you know i think uh you know that technology was just going to be the one you're going to be using. So I think one of the things that we helped for us sometimes was also to um, kind of go away from kind of go away from um, just our general list of activities. So I remember one activity we did online, which was just called like our community celebration. And um, it, it kind of did get drab in the second half of the event because we wanted to get feedback from folks, but we did at the very beginning, like we made a whole video of like the past year and just like, we actually had a pretty good turnout of folks come out for that. And it was just to kind of say, thank you. Like, and I think that's something that kind of gets lost in terms of just general, how like we're trying to constantly educate people around active transportation or trying to work together and collaborate, but there are also, can still be celebration in all of this that we all kind of came out of this, you know, or we're, at, we're just here today, you know, still doing this work. And there's something to value in that. And, and even just taking a step back because it, it was a very hard year for everybody. So I think just being able to do stuff like that where we could, um, and even the bike rides is very much like that. That's, I think just having those kind of things that help so when you are doing this kind of virtual outreach, it's not just about like, let's just educate folks about, you know, um, good design sidewalks. No, let's actually be aware of what these folk, what folks need, both the volunteers and even just the general community and being able to kind of celebrate successes. Um, yeah, I would say that kind of helps, I think, in, in, in the lessons of how we actually, you know, um, did stuff online. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's so important. Thank you. And I really like that, that note, that idea of, you know, looking ahead is obviously important. That's what we're doing most of the time, but remembering what we have all experienced and, you know, remembering or hearing from community members what they've experienced as well over the last, you know, over a year now. So absolutely. Um, so I wanted to make one final um, call for any questions or comments on your part, Dorian or Chris, before I sort of wrap things up here. Any final thoughts or anything? And if not, I will go ahead and roll it up here. Okay. So we're at the end of our session together. Thank you to all of our presenters. Thank you, Chris and Dorian, for your time on this and for sharing your knowledge and experiences. Uh, I encourage everyone to take what you've learned today and apply it to your work. 
And I also want to expend, send a special thank you to our interpreters, Yuvia, Heidi. Uh, finally, we will have these slides uh, for everyone, as well as a link to the recording of the webinar available for you soon. So thanks so much, everyone, for sharing part of your day and have a good rest of your day. <laughs>